With each new installment of any beloved franchise, there's the weight of a very specific set of expectations. Beyond just the name of the series, there's a real conversation to be had about what it means to be a Zelda game, for instance, or a Mario game, or in the case of 2002's Star Fox Adventures, what exactly it means to be a Star Fox game. Given how much Star Fox Adventures deviates from the formula of its predecessors, it was inevitable that the game would spark a few separate conversations. Is it any good as a game? Does it earn its place in the Star Fox canon? And is that even a meaningful distinction? We're gonna take a trip down to Dinosaur Planet to find out when I complete Star Fox Adventures. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist, where today, we're gonna be taking a good look at Star Fox Adventures. Now, when I was gearing up to play this game, the thing that I kept hearing from people is, it's a good game, but it's not a good Star Fox game, which is pretty understandable, considering it wasn't even originally intended to be a part of the franchise. But if a game is good, and it's called Star Fox, doesn't that make it a good Star Fox game? And more importantly, is the game any good, or do people just like it because it stars Fox? See what I did there? Boo! Boo you! Uh. Boo you too! Boo all of you! Boo Earns! Across the board! Let's begin! Yes! Right. Star Fox Adventures was always going to be judged on two fronts, as a new game by Rare, and as the latest entry in the Star Fox franchise, especially riding in the wake of the much-loved Star Fox 64. Originally intended to be a Nintendo 64 game simply called Dinosaur Planet, this game was retooled late in development to be a launch title for the Nintendo GameCube, and to feature everyone's favorite anthropomorphized fox. Assuming you don't count the Disney version of Robin Hood, now that guy, he was charming. It's also notable for being the last Nintendo console game developed by Rare before they were purchased by Microsoft. While the game has drawn comparisons to titles like Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, it even feels more reminiscent of Rare's work with other Nintendo characters like Donkey Kong 64. And similar to some of these earlier Rare games, it was pretty well received on release. The reviews were mostly pretty positive, with the majority of the negative feedback centering on just how much of the Star Fox adventure Star Fox Adventures actually was, or rather wasn't. And that's the debate that has sort of come to dominate any discussion over this game. Does it earn its place as a Star Fox title? Or would it have been better left as a standalone dinosaur adventure? What better way to find out than to complete the living hell out of it? I'll be playing Star Fox Adventures on the Wii, but with the GameCube controller. It'll be functionally the same as playing it on a GameCube, but with a slightly less old and untrustworthy piece of machinery. My main objective here is to beat Star Fox Adventures story, which spans 13 different locations on Dinosaur Planet, including a couple of floating islands orbiting the world. To do this, I'll have to gather up spellstones and Krizoa spirits, which are mystical doodads that will restore the planet's energy force, or whatever. The only major objective outside the main story is collecting the game's eight cheat tokens and depositing them in a well at the center of a maze. The tokens can be purchased at hidden wells throughout the world and can unlock cheats once you've dropped them off at an even bigger well, because those smaller ones apparently weren't good enough for them. And that's pretty much it. Almost everything to do outside of the cheat tokens will get done over the course of completing the story and saving Dinosaur Planet. And honestly, saving a planet full of dinosaurs is the least I can do, considering what happened to them on this planet. Rest in peace, Dino Bros. You were too cool for this world. Due to the 
the shifting of gears that took place during development, Star Fox Adventures often feels like it's at war with itself. The solid but unremarkable dinosaur adventure at its core is constantly wrestling with its inclusion in the Star Fox franchise, and as a result, it never really commits to any of its choices. Star Fox Adventures takes place years after the events of Star Fox 64, and finds Fox McCloud on a mission to rescue Dinosaur Planet from the claws of the evil General Scales, who not only rules them with an iron fist, but has shattered the planet into pieces. When Fox finds the staff of a fox princess named Crystal, who has been encased in, um, well, Crystal, he and a Triceratops prince named Tricky set off to unite the kingdoms of Dinosaur Planet in an effort to unite all six Krizoa spirits so he can unite the pieces of the planet itself. There is a lot of uniting that's going on, is what I'm saying. The story of Star Fox Adventures is fine, but never rises above that. The various tribes and histories of Dinosaur Planet are fun, but Fox always feels like an interloper with no real investment in what's going on outside of getting paid for his main mission. Because Fox never really cares, it's hard for the player to care, and it's one of the major negative effects of squeezing Fox McCloud into a game that wasn't originally about him. The Star Fox elements to the story are few and far between, with the classic Star Fox crew mostly just chiming in over the radio. And when some of the major elements of Star Fox lore do enter the game towards the end, they feel shoehorned in and don't do any favors to the story of Dinosaur Planet. This this keeps the game from settling into a tone as well, though it mostly leans into a light-hearted goofiness that is pretty endearing. The game is charming, but has a hard time earning its emotional moments, since it isn't fully able to explore the dynamics of the planet or dig deep into the antics of the Star Fox crew. It always ends up feeling a bit lost and adrift, just like the scattered chunks of Dinosaur Planet. Sorry. Too soon? The switch from N64 to GameCube is evident here too, with clunky cutscenes that end up disrupting the flow of the story rather than enhancing it. Sometimes there are little neat character moments with the various dinosaur characters that Fox runs into, but just as often it ends up being screechy and awkward. Some of the characters and locations have a lot of personality though, like a floating dinosaur shopkeeper who's so shrill and weird that he circles back around to being awesome. Why is he a dinosaur that can float? Who can say? But he feels like a unique feature of this world, which stands out against many of the other dinosaur designs, which don't stray from the classic Earth dino look. The character models all run the gamut from ugly to cool, with most landing somewhere in the middle. The locations, on the other hand, actually stand out, with views that make the game's original destiny as an N64 game hard to believe. There's a day and night cycle, and I even found myself getting swept away by some of the beautiful sun sunsets and dino populated beaches. While locations do often fall into standard video game types like snowy area, lava area, and ancient dinosaur temple, the regions belonging to specific tribes manage to stand out. The dank swamp village of the Lightfoots feels distinct from open air sky temple of the pterodactyl inspired cloud runners, or the walled fortresses of the earthwalkers, which is the fancy dinosaur planet name for triceratops. This helps dinosaur planet feel like an actual planet with a variety of regions and cultures. The same can't necessarily be said about the soundtrack though, which is fine for the most part, but only really drew my attention once and not for the right reason. When Fox first lays his eyes on Crystal, we hear what can only be described as sexy music. Wow, she's beautiful. It's very porny and gross sounding and immediately pulled me out of the game. Not to mention the ongoing objectification of literal foxy ladies. The rest of the soundtrack is pretty solid, but never quite reaches the majestic heights you'd want while exploring Dinosaur Planet. It's called Dinosaur Planet for God's sakes. It certainly never lives up to the best piece of dinosaur related music ever made, which I ended up just paying Ted to stand behind me and sing while I played the game. Dun, 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 You know, Ted? It actually helps. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, you got it. Dun, 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 dun. Is that the only part you know? Uh. Dun, 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 dun. Not the same, not the same song, but okay. A for effort. Ah, 
so majestic. Although, if I'm being honest, majestic isn't a term you could apply to most of the dinosaur characters in Star Fox Adventures. A more fitting description might be goofy as hell, which is due in large part to the voice acting. That's not to say that there's anything wrong with being goofy, and when it comes to characters like the shopkeeper, I am all for it. And honestly, I have to admire how broad pretty much all of the voice acting is. They just go for it. You must be as mad as me! Go and see the shopkeeper! He should be able to help at the right price! <laughs> It's a little jarring and intense sometimes, but if you're willing to lean into the ridiculousness of it, it's a lot of fun. That said, the whining of your Earthwalker sidekick Tricky can be a little grating. Can you find any blue mushrooms? I'm feeling real tired. And eventually, I started keeping him fed just to shut him up, rather than just doing it because I was supposed to. But you can't say that the characters don't have personality, even if they're sometimes a little too much. The game's various menus and interfaces also have kind of a lot going on, but manage to avoid getting too cumbersome or overwhelming at times. There's an item counter in the lower right hand corner of the screen that I wish had the option to go away, like I could with the sea stick inventory. I actually thought that the inventory, which allows you to switch between your items and various staff skills, would annoy me, but I got used to it pretty quickly. For an old GameCube game, Star Fox Adventures runs pretty smoothly without too many technical hiccups. It crashed on me once in the very beginning of the game, but it never happened again and taught me a valuable lesson about saving constantly. All in all, the design in Star Fox Adventures never feels at peace with itself. Torn between being a standalone dinosaur adventure and a Star Fox game, it keeps the player from ever settling into its wacky, sometimes genuinely pretty world. The game feels the most like itself when it leans into the insanity, like with this beautiful weirdo. Welcome to my store. Feel free to look at the many wonderful items within these walls. Shine on, you crazy dino, you. When it comes to the gameplay, Star Fox Adventures doesn't feel nearly as conflicted. While it's a shame that the Star Fox elements like the Arwing missions end up feeling so half-assed, the core of what Dinosaur Planet was meant to be shines through whenever you're on the ground. And that core is of a competent, mostly enjoyable rare game with a couple of extremely frustrating moments. When outside of the cockpit of his ship, the main mechanic at Fox's disposal is the Sea Stick menu, which lets you switch between three inventories, items found throughout the world that can be used to solve puzzles, staff skills like a fire blast or a ground quake, and tricky commands, which lets your adorably obnoxious little sidekick help you out by digging up secrets or standing on switches. In the air, the game functions just like a classic Star Fox game, but with some pretty uninspired level design. The Arwing missions are short and all feel pretty much the same, with an increasing number of gold rings that have to be grabbed by the end of the level. There is a scoring system for these flight levels if you feel like trying to break your own record, but otherwise, they feel like the afterthought that they are. The same can't be said for the level designs on Dinosaur Planet and its floating islands, which feel more thought out. The world of Dinosaur Planet has an internal logic to it, and unfolds as you unlock new skills that get you into unexplored regions. In some of the temples or more dungeon-like areas, it's easy to see where the frequent Zelda comparison comes from. And while those areas are fun, they lack the polish of something like Ocarina of Time. Pretty much all of the design pivots around what Fox can do with his staff, which definitely isn't overcompensating for anything at all. Some of the staff skills can only be used in certain situations, while others are a little more versatile, like the Fire Blast, which can be used to trigger switches or to shoot obnoxious little bat creatures right out of the goddamn sky. The staff's abilities keep it from being a one-dimensional beaten stick, but none of them will radically alter the way you play the game. The same goes for tricky skills, which can light fires or dig up goodies, but mostly come in handy at scripted moments. Even so though, the staff turned out to be more versatile than I expected, even if the aiming controls for the range skills could have used a little work. Pretty much anytime you have to aim outside of an R-Wing, the reticle is fighting you to get back to the center of the screen, and it takes some real getting used to. In fact, I don't even know if I ever got used to it, which caused a little bit of rage during some segments when you have to shoot stuff out of the sky before a timer runs out. The rest of the time, when Fox is just running around dinosaur 
dinosaur planet, the camera and controls aren't bad. You can center the camera right behind you to help you with platforming sections, and switching skills with the C stick feels pretty natural after a while. When you get close to an enemy, the camera locks on automatically, which is sometimes nice and sometimes a little annoying if you're trying to do something else and end up with a close up of some nasty dino nostrils. Those dinostrils belong to the Sharp Claws, the personal army of General Scales, and the majority of the enemies you'll fight throughout the game. There are big sharp claws and little sharp claws, but the strategy is pretty much always the same. Combat isn't boring exactly and is never super difficult, but it definitely tends to fall into the same few patterns. There are ways to get a little fancier with Fox's staff maneuvers, but most of the time, whacking the bad guys in the face will do the trick. If not, you can freeze them or shock them with the ground quake, which usually knocks them right out. Combat ended up being a smaller part of the game than I expected, which is probably for the best given how repetitive it was. The rest of your time is spent solving dino puzzles, which are just normal puzzles, but on Dinosaur Planet. Don't worry about it though, although you actually might end up worried about it because a lot of the puzzles end up being either too hard or too easy. The Zelda games are possibly the gold standard where puzzles of this type are concerned, and this game doesn't do nearly as good of a job at drawing your eye to the elements you'll need to move on. I've got nothing against hard puzzles, but I want to feel like this game is giving me the tools I need to succeed. Some of the puzzles here are way fun, but sometimes when I figured out the solution, my reaction was, oh, that's dumb. Those puzzles do encourage you to fully explore your environment though, which is also how you'll be scooping up the game's collectibles. The only optional collectible is the cheat tokens, with all the others helping you to progress through the levels. There are fuel cells that let you pilot your R-wing to the floating islands, and bomb spores that, well, you're smart, you can probably figure out what the bomb spores do. These items are always easy to find in the regions where you'll need them, which meant I always ended up with a lot of extras. That wouldn't be a problem if the damn item counter wasn't always taking up the whole bottom right corner of your screen, reminding you of how many goddamn seeds you have. The regions are fun to explore though, even if it's seed central, and it's satisfying to uncover some of the secret wells that spit out cheat tokens. A lot of them are kind of sitting in plain sight, which makes it fun when you really have to work for one. When you approach one of these wells, a creepy voice offers you a token for 20 scarabs, the creepy crawly dinosaur planet currency. Then you've got to take those coins to the game well maze to unlock the cheats. And while I've got nothing against a good maze, I saved up my coins and only went a couple of times. While there are no unlockable modes or anything like that, Star Fox Adventures is full of things that could be called mini games, but with one big problem. None of them are optional. There are all sorts of tests of strength or memory or knowledge, but they're all required to move forward, which makes it frustrating when they're, you know, impossible. Like a sequence where you have to blast missiles while you're on the back of a pterodactyl, but the controls keep fighting you. Flight missions are where a Star Fox game should excel, or a bit where you have to engage in a test of strength by repeatedly slamming a button until your thumb falls off. Now, the frustrating thing about these bits, which are mostly one-offs, is that it feels like the game doesn't trust its own mechanics. These sequences made me set aside the game more than once until I could calm down and try it again. And I've got nothing against difficult minigames, but when the game difficulty comes from laziness and the game insists you have to beat it to move on, I'm not down. And it's a shame too, because the rest of the game's basic design and mechanics are solid. Not amazing, but never as frustrating as these diversions. If you want a solid Zelda-inspired adventure game, you could do a lot worse. As long as you're prepared for an obnoxious challenge or four. If you're looking for a Star Fox game though, you're probably going to be pissed off by how lazily those elements are integrated into the game that probably would have been better left as Dinosaur Planet. Not every game needs to be a franchise franchise installment, you know? Just let the cool dinosaur adventure be a cool dinosaur adventure. And I'm always down for a cool dinosaur adventure. The only real unlockable in Star Fox Adventures are the cheats earned by dropping your cheat tokens down the well, and even calling them cheats is a bit of a stretch. Honestly though, it's kind of nice that everything Dinosaur Planet has to offer comes up through the course of the story. It feels more like a game than a scavenger hunt, and the cheat tokens feel like they just take the right amount of effort to hunt down given what your reward is. The cheats are mostly just new options, like Dino Language subtitles.
titles, or a sepia mode if you're in the mood for an old-timey dinosaur planet like your grandparents had. And some of them don't even get you that. A few tokens just unlock vague messages about the end of the game, and while I'm down with foreshadowing, I shouldn't have to do extra work to unlock it. The game doesn't have a 100% bonus of any kind either, which would be fine if you could at least see the save screen say 100%. But since you can't save the game after you beat the final boss, only during, it's destined to always read 99%, which is basically my OCD kryptonite. Even though I know I completed the game, it kills me that the game won't admit it. It just seems rude, honestly. But it pales in comparison to the beating that my brain took at the hands of some of those mandatory mini games. The game isn't crazy long, and there aren't a million collectibles, but those three or four moments really ate into my soul, which is too bad because huge chunks of the game are actually really pleasant and enjoyable. While I completely completed Star Fox Adventures, there were 23 deaths, 6 Krizoa spirits returned to their rightful resting place, 8 cheat tokens dropped down a well, 16 hours of total playtime, and 2 games that were awkwardly shoved together into one. While there's a lot to like about the key mechanics of Star Fox Adventures, and it's clear that Rare put a ton of love into the game over its various stages of development, it's bound to turn off hardcore Star Fox fans, and some segments of the story stop the game dead in its tracks. So while the cheat tokens are worth completing, I honestly don't know if I can say the same about the game's story. So there you have it. During my adventure through Dinosaur Planet... Are you happy? You happy? It makes you happy, huh? Huh? Ted? It makes you happy? Yeah. You feel good? Yeah. You feel good to interrupt me while I'm doing the show? Yeah. Yeah? Well, let me tell you what. As no. much as I think this was funny about 10 minutes ago, it's not funny anymore. I can see you in there. You can't hide from me. This is about as funny as the fusion of Dinosaur Planet and Star Fox. It just doesn't work. These two things were not meant to be combined, and unfortunately, while the game is super fun, I just don't think they mesh well together. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of play it. And I give you my completionist rating of put a sock in it, Ted, okay? Play it! That's all the time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know what you about today's episode somewhere on the internet. If you like the show, leave a like. Let us know in the comments down below what you want to see Ted dress up as next. I want to see him as a big-ass human recorder. This outfit is so weird for me. I see it at every convention. It's so gross. I don't like being touched by it. It makes a weird sound as a fan. Stop it. Stop it. Stop. Stop it. 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 Subscribe. Bitch.